So a lot of you have given me feedback that you wanted more information on other star systems, not so well-known ones. So I put this together for you. So that's why this is going to be a little bit longer than normal, but I hope you guys enjoy this section. Uh, we're going to be covering Apollonian star seeds. I do get that star system pop up a lot in Akashic readings. Alpha Centauri star seeds, Hadarian Beta Centauri star seeds, Venusian star seeds, Maldekian and Mars star seeds, Draconian gray alien star seeds. I've actually done a few readings for folks with this lineage, um, interestingly enough. Uh, draconian reptilian star seed types and gray alien star seed types and Anunnaki star seeds. So let's get started with Apollonia. Okay, I'm gonna get myself situated here. All right, so Apollonians are not the most talked about type of star seed out there. Apollonia is thought to be a group of eight planets that is either located in the Taurus constellation somewhat close to the Pleiades or possibly within the Proxima Centauri system. So I've, I've heard theories on both. So, um, so they were known to be a creative star system devoted to the arts and not so much technology. Despite not being a common starseed type, they do come up quite a bit in my Akashic readings. So their traits might be ones that resonate with you as well. I see usually correlations between Apollonia and the Pleiades. Um, seems like a lot of Pleiadian starseeds have incarnations in Apollonia and vice versa. So let's get into the starseed types here. Let me go ahead and get myself situated. Okay, um, so Apollonian starseed traits. They have a deep interest in talking and open communication. So unlike the Syrians and the Orion people, they do love to talk. They are super creative and love to be multi-talented throughout their lifetimes. They are usually drawn to the arts and music. They cannot stick to one identity. They react abruptly when others try to restrict them regarding identity. They like to have more of a fluid, I guess, identity. Otherwise, they are the most calm and even-tempered people. They like to be independent, even with all of their emotional needs. They may experience a state of inner conflict between emotions and control, and between the constant push to be more, learn more, and a desire to also rest. Uh, so they're kind of contradictory in a lot of ways. So you see a lot of uh, folks with kind of Gemini or Libra that are kind of associated with Apollonia, but I didn't get very specific with um, stars, uh, zodiac signs with um, the, these groups. Uh, let's see, these folks uh, love to work as healers and artists. Uh, they make excellent healers, teachers, animal trainers, and may be involved with keeping lo local green spaces clean and healthy. So they're environmentally conscious as well. They always help people and who are in need, no matter what it is. They revel in their unique, uniqueness and enjoy being different from others, which is often expressed through their clothing and fashion. They have a deep desire to be self-sufficient and often a need to prove themselves in this incarnation. There's often an attraction to working with children and an interest in human childhood development and nurturing. So you see a lot of teachers with this um, starseed lineage. Uh, they must, however, be wary of falling into a pattern of becoming a professional student while struggling to find their own niche in this incarnation. So they can be a little bit all over the place. Okay, we're going to move on to the Centaurians, the Alpha Centauris, folks. Okay, Alpha Centauri. I get a few folks with this starseed lineage. It's fairly common, not, not super common, but pretty common. So, uh, so Alpha Centaurians come from the Alpha Centauri star system, which is actually the closest star system 
and planetary system to ours. It's only like 3.7 light years from Earth. So that's pretty freaking close. And there's actually inhabitable planets in Alpha Centauri, which is really exciting. Although I think the planet probably is very different from Earth. Uh, so the Alpha Centaurians um, are an advanced civilization and they have seeded some of their souls here on this planet to aid in our development. So let's get into some of their traits. What are they about? Let's scroll this up here. Okay. All right. So Alpha Centauri starseed traits. Uh, they tend to really love purple and violet. Although I think that's a color that Arcturians love as well. But as you saw with Prince. So, and I love purple too. So, um, uh, they usually have a career or are seeking a career in the scientific field. So they tend to be more technology driven. Um, since they were a child, people have said that they were scary smart. They enjoy building and inventing things related to biology and chemistry since a young age. Centaurs, the mythical half man, half horse has always fascinated these folks. They're drawn to the Centaurus constellation. Knowledge and wisdom are their top priorities in life. Uh, so they might feel that people around them aren't at their level of intelligence, but they're not egotistical or boastful about it. Um, they don't like being in crowds. Um, they prefer being alone in a quiet space. Okay, this is kind of funny. Um, <laughs> people say that uh, they're complicated, particularly in romantic relationships. So again, they don't do well in relationships, I guess. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of us that don't do well in relationships. Okay. Uh, so they might be judgmental of others and isolate themselves because of it. Um, mostly a quiet individual um, and a daydreamer. But at the same time, they're independent and confident. Uh, so they're not as connected to spirituality as the Pleiadians and Syrians, but they understand spiritual concepts easily. They're very concerned with social justice and equality for all humans, so all humans. I see this a lot with, um, actually my aunt is an Alpha Centauri starseed and she is quite a little firecracker. I don't know, interesting personality. Love, love my aunt in Amarillo, Texas. Okay, Hadarians. Let's get into the Hadarian types. Okay. Hadarian starseeds come from Beta Centauri. So they're quite the opposite of the Alpha Centauri folks. So you're gonna see this with their personality traits. They were all about the love, unconditional love, and they're on earth to spread more of it. Uh, the story goes that the Hadarians were invaded by a tyrannical race of beings and uh, they had to leave their planets and uh, escape to escape enslavement, okay? Um, so many of them came here to earth, but it's difficult for them to remember what happened because of the trauma that they endured. Let's get into some of their traits. These are the love children, all about the love, all about the love, unconditional love. Because of their loving nature, sometimes they can be taken advantage of by others because of their pure way of loving others. These are the individuals that want nothing more in life than to have strong relationships with others, either romantic, friendship, etc. They may come across as hippies preaching free love. They feel happier and more fulfilled when in a relationship, even if it's an, a toxic one, unfortunately. They are here to learn how to love others and themselves along with the power of free will. They, are, they have very strong empathic abilities. They can feel the emotions of other beings, including animals and plants. So they're very, very much in tune with everything. Tend, they tend to be shy or introverted until they get to know you. Their goals are not in alignment with money or financial success. They are, feel like they're generally here to help others. So these are really true humanitar humanitarian types of people. 
uh, when they, if they do work in the corporate world, uh, they usually tend to work in areas where they can be part of a team, usually counselors, philanthropists, and humanitarians. Okay, we're going to move along to, uh, to Venusians. So let's get into the Venusians. Uh, I do get a few star seeds. I actually recently did a Akashic reading for a Venusian star seed. And he was a lovely man that lived in Switzerland. So they, they seem to have um, quite a bit of um, that, that uh, Northern European genetics, just like the Pleiadians. Um, so is it possible that other planets in our solar system once supported life? Um, absolutely. And uh, could they still be in existence in other planes of dimensions? Absolutely. Uh, so this includes Venus, which brings us to our Venusian star seeds. Venusians live in the fourth dimension, and they're also called the Hathors. Hathor is an ancient Egyptian cow goddess of love and motherhood. It is said that she's from Venus and seated Venusians on Earth to teach love and compassion. So let's get up to these Venusian qualities. Okay. Um, so I don't get a lot of star seeds with this type, but um, we do see a few. So Venusian star seeds tend to be tall and slender, um, generally speaking. Um, they are sensual and passionate individuals. They may have a hard time connecting or committing to one mate. Um, they are nurturing and compassionate, very aligned with the divine feminine consciousness. Um, even the men are very divine feminine with the Venusians. Uh, they're highly spiritual beings, sometimes to a fault, and need to be reminded or taught how to ground themselves. They usually tend to be high up in their head crown chakras. They feel, they feel very connected to the universe, higher self, and guides. They have an interest in outer space and ancient civilizations. They can be labeled as flighty and not so grounded. They have a huge interest in metaphysics. I think we see this a lot with a lot of different starseed types, but, um, but uh, you'll see this with Venusians. Um, and bringing the new age in. So they're drawn to ancient Egypt and namely the goddess Hathor, as well as Venus and Aphrodite. These are often very attractive individuals with coveted facial features. So the women are usually very beautiful and feminine and the men are masculine and model-like. Uh, they tend to be interested in alternative healing modes, uh, particularly us using sound and ritual. So they tend to be sound healers. Okay, well, let's bring up the Mars folks the Mar Maldekian Mars. Okay, I don't get a lot of star seeds from Maldek or Mars, but occasionally I'll get someone who's had incarnations in these systems. So you might find that you have some of these qualities, but, um, but Maldek was a planet um, that used to be exist in our solar system between Jupiter and Mars that got destroyed a long time ago and now is the asteroid belt. Okay, so, um, and Maldek no longer exists for that reason. Um, so Mars also, there was um, some folks that have had incarnations in Mars when it was still inhabitable. Um, so they, it was thought that maybe at one time it was inhabitable and it had water on their planets. Uh, so there isn't a lot known about Maldek or Martian star seeds, but um, some claim that they have originations on these planets. So that's why I thought, you know, I'd cover this section as well. So let's get into their star seed types. So people that have Mar Maldekian or Martian star seed traits, and the reason why I combined them is because Usually Maldekians have also had incarnations on Mars and vice versa. So they seem to be very closely connected. Um, it's very similar traits as well. Um, so they're usually drawn to the planet Mars. Um, they find a desire to travel there, or in interested in the colonization of Mars, or they're drawn to the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, 
once Maldek. They tend to be very intelligent, technical minded and detail oriented. They have strong, steady personalities with leadership capabilities. They have a tendency to analyze events, experiences and interactions with people as they believe there is more than what appears on the surface. This must be kind of a past life trait or something they had to develop. They often are quite reserved and seem distant or hard to approach, not very trusting. However, in relationships, um, they tend to be very loyal, honorable, and trustworthy. This is an interesting little factoid. Um, they are fascinated with magic and the use of, use of energy to create and manifest. They love challenges, mysteries, and the unknown and unexplainable. Another little interesting factoid, they love the tales of King Arthur, the Knights of the Round Table, and Merlin the Magician, as these stories combine magic with loyalty and honor. They have a desire to advance the human race. They have a strong connection to water and the fire elements. Uh, they have memories and dreams of being on the surface of Mars or Maldek. Okay, now we're going to get into some of the not so light systems or darker stars, star types. So let's bring up draconian gray alien star seeds. Now, this is a very rare type. I don't get very many folks that have these um, genetics, um, at least not within my community, but um, occasionally I do some readings for folks that are dragon cast. And you might have seen some of those um, readings featured on my, my YouTube channel. So if you're interested in that, check out the YouTube channel. I think I have a couple or two or three videos on uh, this particular lineage. So let's get into the draconians. Uh, so draconian star seeds are from the Draco constellation. So Draco means dragon, therefore many draconian star seeds are linked to dragons and reptiles of various kinds. The reptilian race, life livgarians, greys, and other draconians come from Draco. Uh, although greys are also from Zeta Reticuli. Um, there are some draconians who are selfish and some say they're evil, while others are here to help wake humanity and raise consciousness. Those are usually the folks that come to me for readings are, the, are that type, okay? So not the evil ones. Um, you'll see debates going both ways when it comes to reptilians and greys particularly, but you know in your heart better than anyone else online, you know, if you're aligned with this. So some draconian traits. So we decided to break it up between draconian, reptilian, and gray alien. So some re draconian, reptilian, starseed traits. So they tend to be drawn to math, science, and technology. They're leaders in their fields and communities. They're natural leaders um, and work well, leading a team, organization, or government. They might have felt and misunderstood their entire lives. Um, this, I definitely seen this with the Akashic readings I've done for these folks. They felt very misunderstood. Uh, they don't take kindly to authority higher than themselves. When they're not in alignment, uh, they can be money hungry and manipulative. Okay. Um, when they are in alignment and from a higher dimension, they come here wanting to unite people and work towards a common goal. These folks are talented at leading, building, and coordinating efforts. Um, they're good at inventing and creating new ways to accomplish old tasks. So this is really their thing. They always finish what they start. So unlike the Apollonians and <laughs> the Pleiadians, they, they, they do pretty well um, in this area. Uh, naturally, they're attracted to reptiles, amphibians, such as lizards, turtles, snakes, etc., and of course, dragons. They may have lizard-like physical characteristics, thin, long faces, thin bodies, lizard-like eyes, and facial features. Just like the Arcturians, they might have lower body temperature, so they find themselves being cold more often than not. You crave warm weather and the sun without having a thyroid or medical disorder. I don't know, I'm like that too, I'm always cold. So 
That's me too. Maybe I have some reptilian in me. I don't know. Um, so people often tell you that you're cold or void of emotions. Drawn to the sun and warmth. So they prefer warmer clients. Climates. I don't know. Maybe I'm reptilian. I don't know. I seem to like warmer clients. I think I think it's mostly because I'm Lemurian. I don't know. But um, adept in, fi uh, in fitting in. So they're like a chameleon. Um, many of them can be shapeshifters. I do, I've, I've ran across some reptilians that are shapeshifters. They generally tend to find jobs in politics, community leaders, military, ar architecture, and construction. Okay, so they like those jobs that other star seeds hate. Okay, um, yeah, we hate those jobs. Okay, let's get into the gray alien types. So um, I don't think I have yet to do a reading for anybody that is truly a gray alien starseed, but I have done readings for folks that have gray alien genetics, such as Esasani and Yael. So if you are aligned with those, um, with those groups, uh, some of this might apply to you, I don't know. Um, so just like the reptilians, you might have been misunderstood your whole life. So you might feel like you haven't fit in. I don't know. I haven't seen this yet, but they might have a large head with a disproportionately smaller body. Okay. Um, they don't have much or any hair on their body. Okay. I don't know. I haven't seen this yet, but could, could be out there. Um, they have an intense interest in human genetics and DNA, so maybe they even have a career in this field. Just like the reptilians and quote unquote Arcturians, they have a lower body temperature. They probably like sunny climates. Uh, they have an interest or occupation usually in healing and or medicine. Um, they could have a photographic memory. They're extremely awakened spiritually and very perceptive, detail-oriented. They have dark brown, almost black eyes, usually drawn to the constellations of Draco, Zeta Reticuli, and Orion. They have an interest or fascination with dragons. Uh, they also, like the reptilians and Orion folks, might have problems emotion, of showing their emotions to others and being vulnerable. They usually work best with a well-organized team. All right, so we're gonna get into our last starseed group for today. Like I said, there's many, many others. Uh, we just didn't have time to cover them all and we're already going over time as it is, but uh, we're gonna talk about Anunnaki. Let's get into the Anunnaki folks. Okay. Um, so we have, a, Anunnaki is one of the most controversial star groups I work with. And I have done a, a readings for a few folks with Anunnaki lineage. Um, and um, they generally tend to be of the light, at least the ones that are desiring to have readings with me, but um, they usually deal uh, or struggle quite a bit with duality consciousness. So, so they kind of go forth, back and forth between light and dark aspects of themselves. So if you were to research the Anunnaki online, you would find all kinds of conspiracy theories out there. So some people believe that the Anunnaki are demons, evil aliens that are controlling the masses, et cetera, et cetera. So here's what I believe about the Anunnaki. Uh, they're a branch of hybrid beings from the Sirius C civilization, and were part of the human creation in the beginning of Earth's history. Because of their part with the establishment of Earth, particularly in ancient Sumer, they are often thought to be Sumerian gods. Moreover, they lived on a planet called Nibiru, and some sources claim that they are the same as the gray or the reptilians. However, they are not. They're not the same. So a lot of people think, oh yeah, Anunnaki, they're just um, glorified reptilians. No, actually they're hybrids, so not at all. Uh, the Anunnaki starseeds are a new realm of incarnating beings of whom we're just beginning to learn about. So if you feel an alignment of that, uh, with this group, you might have some of these traits. So Anunnaki starseed traits. You're drawn to ancient civilizations, specifically Sumer, Babylon, Akkadia, and Assyria. 
You feel as if your soul is ancient, older than humanity. You have a strong need for ritual in your life, both mundane and spiritual. Uh, you tend to be drawn to shows like Ancient Aliens, specifically when focused on the Anunnaki. You have a longing to return to the skies. You might have, have a larger head and particularly large almond-shaped eyes. You favor the air element over the other elements. You're drawn to work uh, or drawn to or work with ancient Sumerian, Babylonian, Akkadian, and Assyrian gods like Enlil, Enki, and Inanna Ishtar. You have ancestry from the Middle East, Eastern Europe, or West Asian areas. You might have had dreams of or of flying or are able to astral project into space easily. Just like the Lyran avian people, you might have the feeling of wings on your back, this tingling or heavy sensation between your shoulder blades. So that's it for the star seed groups for today. I hope you guys found this um, informative and interesting. Um, we're gonna get into the last slide here. So um, did any of these star seed types resonate with you? Uh, if did you find which star seed type you are? Maybe you felt like a few of these resonated, which actually makes perfect sense since a lot of us have had incarnations in various systems and we might have picked up traits from all of these different systems. Um, so, and we might have incarnated in more than just one planet or one star system. I know with me personally, I connect obviously with Arcturus, but I also feel very drawn to uh, Sirius and Pleiades and even to Andromeda at times, you know, so it depends on, so you might have qualities of various types. Uh, so keep in mind that this list doesn't include every single star seed type um, as the universe is inconceivably large. Um, so we tried to, narrow it down to just the types that we see often with Akashic readings. So finally, I encourage you to read more about the different star seed types that resonated and also read about the stars and the planets themselves. So we're gonna go into the um, credit slide here. So Powers, you're gonna have to click um, to bring down the names. There we go. Okay, so we got Zoom and tech re support, that's Powers Foss. Yay, Powers. <laughs> Title page and email marketing, Christina Shea. So all those beautiful emails that you're getting was from her and me. Um, video editing, also tech support is Billy Rude. Content, yay, Billy. He's here as well. Uh, content editing and email support, and Sieg. Lighting is Ruben Diaz. And just a little helpful resource, if you guys can find this book, because I think it's out of print. But um, this was, I got some information from this book called Where Are You Really From? A Family of Light Guide to Self-Understanding Through Planetary Origin by Joe Amidon. I just checked on Amazon, it's not available on Amazon. So you might go need to go to some used book purveyors to find this book. But it is an awesome one if you can get it. Okay, so we're gonna to go to the next last slide and then you'll need to click again to get the words. So thank you for attending this webinar and uh, you can see my info and my website. So thank you very much. And I think we're gonna open it up to Q and A. I think we have a few minutes for that. So, um, so I hope you guys found the, this enjoyable. So I'm gonna to have to look on, I think we powers. Got some good questions here, Debbie. So um, okay. one of them is, I am told that I'm a blue light imager, which I've never heard of before. Okay. It may not be accurate as I feel like so many of these resonate. How do you figure out what your true origin point is? Or is there a meditation recommendation that you have to help us figure out what kind of star system we come from? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, a blue light imager, okay. Um, I would say most likely the star systems you're probably connected with is Andromeda Galaxy or Andromeda. Um, that's the impression I'm getting from that, that verbiage. Um, 
However, to answer your other question about how to know specifically what star systems you're connected with, I think it's just an internal knowing. Um, um, you might hear the word Andromeda and feel like a, a resonance with it, or you feel a resonance with Orion Nebula or a resonance with, uh, I don't know, Pegasus or some other star system. Um, that's probably the best way to know is through your inner knowing. Um, as far as specific meditation types, um, I would sit, look to Steve Noble's meditation. He's on YouTube. He has beautiful meditations on various different star origins and how to connect with your star family. I would rec I think he has a specific one on how to connect with your star family. Um, I would recommend that for you if you want to really get some validation on what star system you're really connected with. And this one, Julie writes, Debbie, if you would share your insight on Enlil and Anki, there's so much static in the community right now involving their intention to cause friction and division among starseeds. Please share your input. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, when I've done readings for Anunnaki starseeds um, that have come to me for Akashic readings, they've often were on the team, what I call team Enlil, I think, or Enki. Enki was a good one. Yeah, he was a good one. So, so what I get is that they were extraterrestrials from the planet Nibiru. So planet Nibiru actually used to revolve around the star system Sirius C. And my understanding with Sirius C is that I think it went through a natural disaster of some sort and it got destroyed. So Nibiru kind of shot off its, uh, its normal orbit and was, was uh, traveling towards Earth. Uh, so um, Enki and Enlil, I think were probably two of the, the Anunnaki leaders that decided to inhabit Earth. However, they were um, very opposed to each other as far as their philosophy. Uh, Enlil wanted to just enslave the indigenous humans that lived on planet Earth and uh, just wanted to pretty much, he had this kind of patriarchal, um, authoritative kind of viewpoint. A lot of people say that the God Jehovah that is talked about in, in the Bible might be actually Enlil. Okay, so maybe not like a real God, but uh, an Anunnaki God. Enki, on the other hand, was more concerned with the development of humanity and was more concerned with keeping humans free. Um, so they ended up, I think, uh, becoming um, opposed to each other. And this created division amongst the Anunnaki ranks. Um, so there was some Anunnaki folks that sided with uh, Enlil and some that sided with Enki. Um, like I said, most of the folks that come to me for readings that of, are of this specific lineage are more the um, Enki folks, or I call Team Enki, but, um, but perhaps maybe in the past they weren't. Um, I think this created um, some issues around the manipulation of human genetics, where um, I think Enlil was very much in favor of dumbing down the human genome, uh, going from a 12 strand DNA to two strands, which created a lot of physical issues in the, in the human physicality to the point where um, I think um, Enki decided to intervene and call in the assistance of other Syrian geneticists to help boost the human genome. I mean, it got to the point where humans weren't even able to um, ascend, uh, which was really pretty shocking. But um, so um, that's my viewpoint on it. I can go probably hours on this topic, but we have other questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and move ahead. And this is a good one from Courtney. She writes, are we able to choose where we incarnate to next? That's really good, good question. Yeah, I, I get that question a lot when um, I do Akashic readings for people. They want to know where they're going to end up after this lifetime, because I think a lot of us feel like we've been on Earth for a long time and 
we're really to move, really ready to move on. <laughs> okay, so uh, my understanding is uh, for a long time here on Earth, uh, there was a false reincarnation matrix that was set up where Earth souls, not necessarily star seeder uh, souls, but Earth souls were being processed over and over and over again because they were going through the false light. Um, and uh, this was set up by the elites or um, extraterrestrial groups that, you know, like reptilians that were feeding off of earth suffering or earth human suffering. Um, so they would just, they wouldn't evolve. They would just have a life over and over and over again. Um, my understanding is that false matrix, uh, reincarnation matrix has been dismantled. And so now um, souls are now able to be processed appropriately in Arcturus, which is the stargate of souls. And so if you're getting pro if you're a soul getting processed in Arcturus, you most certainly have choice in where you want to go to next. Um, usually what happens after a soul passes on in the physical realm is that they'll go to Arcturus, they'll go through a life review, they'll work with their guides and their higher self on what uh, what's uh, I guess goals they want to have or what they do do they want to experience in their next lifetime and then they'll be given a choice of various incarnations so uh, it might be like two choices or ten choices it depends on what your goals are but usually the Arcturians will assist the soul in this process so yes um, I think we're going to see a lot of um, star seed souls and maybe even a few earth souls that are going to have incarnations in other systems um, in the next lifetime. Some of us will stay behind and help to establish, I would say, the fifth dimension um, in when earth ascends to the fifth dimension. So I do see that sometimes in readings. So sometimes in readings, I can see future probabilities for folks, but um, I would I, my, I would venture to guess that most of us will choose to leave the planet because we will have accomplished our mission. Great question, though. Thank you. And this is an interesting one from Karen. Okay. And she asks, Debbie, when you do your Akashic Records readings, are you seeing the characteristics of the starseeds from their aura? Absolutely. That's usually how I figure out where systems people are from, in addition to verifying it in the records. So I, re I, I taught a club course last year called Recognizing Extraterrestrial Frequencies, which actually teaches um, folks how to read auras and how to read certain um, frequencies or colors within the auras that might be aligned with certain star systems. This is kind of a simplified approach. So, um, so if you take decide to take this course, it's in, in my training section of my website. Um, it's a very inexpensive course, well worth taking though. Um, so you might find that, you know, well, you know, I'm starting to see certain colors in people's auric fields. Um, uh, so for instance, just to give you an example, I mentioned before that with Arcturians, you usually see kind of a purplish blue aura. So, so they might have overlays of different colors, but if you see that predominant color, it indicates that the person is from Arcturus. Originally, um, uh, there's some folks that might have like a whole rainbow of colors in their auric field. So if you see that, it might indicate that they've had incarnations in various systems, you know. So, um, but yes, the answer to that is yes. All right. And this person, I believe, is asking about your readings, but specifically in your Akashic Records readings, can people find out where their other family members' origins are? Totally. Oh yeah. I get, I get that question a lot. That's like one of the most popular questions I get. It's like, where is my husband from, or where is my parents from, or, or my kids, you know? So we get that a lot. Um, when I do Akashic readings for folks, um, usually uh, your soul records will be intertwined with your family members' soul records. So usually I have the capability of accessing their records through yours. So even though I might not necessarily know these people or even you know, have any connection with them, I can usually determine what star system they're from or, or, what, their, or what their incarnations have been and even some personal information about them just through 
connecting with their records through your records. Um, so, uh, so sometimes people and their families will come from very similar star systems or the same star systems. Sometimes they come from diametrically very different star systems. Um, but yes, you can definitely have access to that um, in the records. And as is uh, uh, something I'll be teaching when I teach my Galactic Akashic Reading course next year that Billy and I are working on. There's Billy over there. So hi, Billy. <laughs> All right, well, Debbie, we have time for maybe two or three more questions if you-, if you uh, I think we have time. Good. Yeah, no, I think we can go along here. Um, this person, Cheryl writes, is the angel realm different from the starseed systems? Mm, yeah, I would say yes. Uh, the angelic realm, um, that's more of a higher dimensional realm. So you rarely see angelic beings incarnating as humans here on earth. Although um, I occasionally have done readings for folks that are earth angels that have chosen to have an er earthly incarnation, but they're connected to the angelic realm. Uh, however, um, the star seeds are more connected with various planets, dimensions, and star systems and galaxies. Uh, whereas the angelic realm, um, they're mostly connected with galactic center in our galaxy. So, uh, and uh, they've also had some dealings with the Pleiades and also with Sirius and various systems, but, uh, but they're a totally different uh, family group than the starseed families. All right, and this is a good one about twin flames. This one, yeah, we love kind, twin kind of flames. Close, but uh, Sarah writes it's kind of a two-parter. So let me no. just ask the first one: Are twin flame souls always originated from the same galactic star system? Not necessarily. I would say more often than not, they usually are. But I've actually had some twin flames that, when their soul split. One may have decided to incarnate in Lyra, and one might have decided to incarnate in Vega, or we might have had one that decided to incarnate in the Pleiades and one in Sirius. So usually the goal with Twin Flames is to have as many varied experiences as possible. So, um, so the masculine aspect of the soul will have a variety of different experiences or the, and the feminine will have a variety of different experiences and then they'll come together um, and they'll pull apart. They come together, come together apart. apart. I don't see this a lot with twin flames. And so uh, these souls uh, will oftentimes have incarnations in different systems uh, and they may even start off in different systems. Uh, usually, however, um, they will start off in the same system, but then will start having incarnations in different systems from there. So it, 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 it can be a variety of different things. And the second part of the question. And the second part is once they've found each other on earth, does that mean that their split soul aspects are now fully integrated? Hmm. I would say yes and no on that one. Um, I think it depends on the individual twin flame group or as couple, um, whether or not that's the case, because there's actually quite a few twin flames that reconnect with each other um, when they're here on earth. And they end up having this runner chaser syndrome going on where they constantly are mirroring each other. So, they, um, so they're not really well integrated. Uh, they might not want to be together or one party will wanna be with each other. The other party keeps running. So as the runner keeps running off um, the chaser wants to be with the, with, with the runner. Um, so it gets really super complicated, speaking of complicated relationships. But um, I would say I have found, I've have done some readings for twin flame souls that are very well integrated, that have worked through a lot of their karma in past earth lives and are, um, they usually become like spiritual power couples. So they um, are doing the spiritual work together and, um, are really feeling, I would say, empowered with their missions here on earth. All right, well, we have time for one more question. Okay. And this person, Dean, would like to know what to look for 
to avoid going to the false light that you spoke of? Oh, that's interesting. I get that question a lot. <laughs> go to the light. Go to the light, go, but not the false light. Not, light. not, not that light, the other light. Um, yeah, I, I, I get that question a lot. My understanding is that I don't think this is something we have to worry about anymore as there is no false light um, that's been dismantled. But I guess if you really want to make sure, I would say don't go to the white light, go to the golden or other colored lights. <laughs> Okay, so don't go, the white light is the false light. So, um, but um, if you're a star seed, most star seeds are not that connected to earth, uh, earth karma. So um, I, I, I would say this is not something to worry about, but, uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, we're, we're not gonna be going to any false lights from here on out. I think we're done. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I hope this was enjoyable. I hope that maybe gave you some additional insights into yourself, what star systems you might be connected with. Thank you very much um, for joining us today and we hope to see you in future webinars. Thank you.